So good to see you here today. My name is Roby. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, today we are kicking off a new series called You Belong Here. And we're going to be talking about this over the next few weeks. And I just want to start with this idea as we, we jump in here today. I just want to start with this idea. Sometimes, and maybe oftentimes, the most extraordinary things are hard to find. They're rare. In fact, sometimes you'll, you'll know of or you'll have experienced something extraordinary, but it's not just easy to go and get it and to find it. Let me just illustrate that with this. Has anyone ever heard of the soda called Cheerwine? Anyone heard of this? Let me see some hands. Anyone heard of this? A few of you? Okay, there are some pe people typically who have tried Cheerwine are weirdly fanatical about it, okay? And Cheerwine, you can, up until recently, could only find in um, the Carolinas, in that region. It was, it's made in this small city in North Carolina. And it's similar to um, so another soda from Texas. If you are from that area, it's called Big Red. Anyone ever tried Big Red the soda? A few of you, I've got some Texans waving at me back there. Now I'm uncomfortable. Okay. Um, Big Red's another one of those sodas. But here's one that I bet most of you haven't heard of. It's kind of a ginger ale type soda, and it's out of Kentucky called Ale 8. And when my, my sister and brother-in-law were in college in the Kentucky area, the Lexington area, they introduced this soda to me. And so I made them, every time they came home, bring me a case of Ale 8, because up until recently, you couldn't find this anywhere. And so they would bring it in. It was actually felt like really secretive, like this black market situation. We're in like an abandoned parking lot, you know, and I'm getting this. And so anyway, there are times that there are things that are extraordinary, and oftentimes those things that are extraordinary are very hard to find, hard to come across. There's only certain places, certain venues where you can, you can get it or experience it. And this, the Bible talks about this one thing that is extraordinary, and there's only one place that it can be experienced. And what it says about this, it's something that, that all of us are drawn to, but what it says about this, I'm going to be honest, it's controversial. It's probably going to push you when you hear what the Bible says about this. I want to jump into a passage in the Bible. It's found in the book of 1 John. We're going to look at this in the next few weeks. If you have a Bible or a Bible app open to 1 John, we're going to look in chapter 4. A little bit about the author behind this letter is a guy named John. He wrote several books in the Bible. He wrote the book just called John. It's actually a biography about Jesus. He was one of the closest disciples to Jesus, so he writes an eyewitness biography about uh, Jesus' life. He wrote the book of John. John also wrote the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. And he wrote three letters that we have in the Bible, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. We're looking at 1 John today, and we're going to start in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, open there with me. Let, let's see what he says here. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. All right, now let's break this out a little bit here, um, what he's saying. The first thing is he calls the recipients of the letter beloved. And he's calling, by extension, us, ones who are loved, beloved. And that's actually very significant. We're going to talk about that a little bit more next week. He goes on to say, let us love one another. Now, of all things that the Bible could say that is not surprising, that would be it. It doesn't catch us off guard that the Bible is saying something like, hey, we probably should be a little more loving in our lives. So if you're hearing this and, and you're tempted to say, okay, I got it, John, noted, I probably could have used a nicer tone with my kids earlier this week. Wouldn't be a bad idea for maybe I fold the laundry for my wife, okay? I, I could have sent that email a little nicer that I sent to my coworker or when I was behind that guy at the stoplight and it turned green and he didn't immediately move, okay? 
maybe not land on the horn that hard. Okay, I got it. John noted, I, I will be a little nicer. Okay, this is not a surprise that this kind of thing is in, in the Bible. And if that's all he said, we'd all say, got it. Thank you, John. Um, we'll, we'll move on. We'll all try and be a little more kind and, and call it a day. But he says a little bit more than that. He says, we should love one another. And then he says this. He says, because love is from God. Now, that's interesting. Because he's not saying that, okay, there's God, and there's this separate concept out there called love. Now, what he's actually saying is love is subordinate to God. Love has been created and invented by God. In fact, he says at the end, one of the most famous things in the Bible, he says, um, God is is love. Did you hear that in there? And specifically, he's not saying love is God, is he? He's not saying the greatest, most ultimate concept in the universe is love. If we could all just love, everything would be fine. No, he's, saying, he's not saying that. Love is not God. Love is not ultimate. God, the being, is God, and love flows out of him. The concept of love is what it is, because it's an attribute of God that flows out of him. He sets the, the confines of what love is. Love is from God. Okay, so we, we got it. So far, we should love, and love is from God. But what he says next, that's what gets a little uncomfortable. He says, because anyone who loves knows God and is born of God, and the inverse is true as well. If someone does not love, then they don't know God. All right, now we got to land on this for a few minutes because I've heard this, these verses lifted out of their context and really like all twisted around and completely obliterated. I've heard this passage used before to say, see, that's really all that matters. If you want to know who, you know, is going to heaven, if you want to know who's saved, really the big thing is just be more of a loving person. That's all that God wants. If you could just be a little bit more loving, then that's what this world needs. And, and just look around. Loving people, they're in, they're going to heaven. Not loving people are not going to heaven. But the problem is that cannot be what, he, what John is meaning. Because the entire testament of the Bible, and especially the New Testament, and even more specifically of everything else John himself wrote, says something completely different. It was in the biography of Jesus, the book of John, that John records this encounter that Jesus had with a religious teacher named Nicodemus. And in that encounter, this religious leader says to Jesus, hey, um, all right, Rabbi, just lay it down for me. What do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do to get to heaven? And Jesus said the famous phrase, you have to be born again. It's not a phrase invented in the 70s. It's a phrase that Jesus himself spoke. He says, you have to be born again. And the guy said, okay, um, what? So I'm a grown man. How am I, in the world am I going to be born again? And it's a few verses later that Jesus says the most famous thing he ever said. He said, God so loves this world. He looks down on it. He so loves the world. He gave his only son that whoever believes in the son, whoever believes in him, they won't perish, but they'll have everlasting life. He says, you want to know how to get to heaven? You want to know what it means to be born again? Put your faith in the son that's from God. That's the only way. It's through the Son that you find eternal life, find heaven. It's a couple chapters later in that same biography about Jesus that Jesus says this. He says simply, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus' words. In the, the, this letter that we're reading, 1 John, if we were to rewind a couple verses, he says to his recipients, he says, hey, do you want to know if a teaching's from God? He says, if that teaching declares that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is from the Father, then you know it's from God. It's, Jesus is what matters. He says that in a couple verses after what we just read, in 1 John 5, he says, John says this, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I'm writing these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. 
John is completely clear all through this letter, all through the things he's written. It's clear all through the New Testament, all through the Bible. There's only one way to get to God. There's only one way to get to heaven. It has to be through Jesus. So if that's true, if that's what John's claiming, then these verses here, they get a little dicey. Because what he just said is, if you know God, only if you know God and are born of God, there's that born again language uh, there again. He says, basically, if you know God, if you're following Jesus, if you're a Christ follower, then you can love. And so it kind of sounds like whatever he's defining as love, whatever he's defining as that, whatever concept that is, only a Christ follower can show it. Look at what he says in, um, I want to rewind back to 1 John 3, 1. Look what he says. John says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. In other words, John's trying to say, look, I'm trying to express to you, there's this measure of love, there's this manner of love, there's this type of love that specifically it's from God and only those who know God and are followers of Christ have been found by God, born of God, can express this kind of love. Okay, let's see what he says next because this is tough. Let's keep going. This is 1 John 4. Look at verse 9. Look what it says next. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I love that good Bible word there, propitiation, okay? And I want you to be able to impress all your friends with the word propitiation. So let's try saying this together. You guys, you ready for this? Okay, ready? Propitiation. I was, that was so-so, okay? If you're saying it right, you're spitting all over the person in front of you. Okay, so let's just try this again. Propitiation. Okay, that, that was much better. Okay, what does this word propitiation mean? It's very simply saying God loves us so much he sent his son to be a sacrifice on our behalf so that we could go from deserving the wrath of God to getting just the favor of God. He says, I'm talking about this type of love that's only from God. And he says, and God manifested it. He demonstrated it. He revealed it. He pulled the cover off and said, let me show you a demonstration of this extraordinary kind of love. He says, God looks down at humanity and looks down at our sin. What do you mean by sin? I mean, at the core of each one of us, there's down deep, no matter how good we are at hiding it, how good we are at, at telling ourselves it's not there, I, I really believe every one of us, at some point when you dig down, there's a self-centeredness. Maybe it's self-preservation. Maybe it's, it's looking out for number one. Maybe it's, it's getting what I deserve, getting my fair share, or, or just... At some point, deep down, there's this, I'm looking out for myself, self-centeredness. And it should be a God-centeredness because he made us. But deep down, we have things in our lives like sin. And God looks down and says, but I love them so much, I'm sending my son. And do you notice it just kind of emphasized it? He sent his son, his only son. He said, I sent Jesus down who, to be a sacrifice. He dies brutally on a cross. Why? Because he is the sacrifice. He's the payment for our sins so that we can have complete forgiveness of our sins. Rose again from the dead saying that the payment has been made in full. So you know what that means? That means it doesn't matter what's lingering in your past. It doesn't matter if you came to church today or you're watching online today and you're saying, look, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what mistakes I've made. You don't know the skeletons in the closet. You don't know the things that still haunt me. You don't know the guilt and the shame that I feel. You don't know what I did even over the weekend. You don't know the things I'm in the midst of, the things I don't know how to get out of, the things that I've done or have been done to me. You don't know the, the chains that I carry on, around my neck, just the weights, the burden of, of the guilt and the shame that I feel. You don't, you don't know how, how I feel like that. 
But what this passage is saying is Jesus changed everything. Those weights at the foot of the cross because he died for you, they, we took them off at the foot of the cross. Those chains weighing us down, they, they get cut. Why? Because we cannot out the power of the cross. That means there's never a morning that you wake up and you say, oh my goodness, Jesus, I'm trying to follow you, but I am so far from you today, God. God says, uh, no, you're right here in my hand. You've never left here. I've forgiven you sins, past, present, and future. You live in a state of forgiveness. My perpetual, um, perpetually dumping and flooding grace all over you, washing you clean. He says, I accepted you just as you are, and I'm holding you in my hands. But the good news is he accepts us just how we are, but he doesn't leave us just how we were. He says, I'm welcoming you in, but I'm, I'm bringing you along into something. I'm pulling these things out of you. I've got a vision for what I'm going to do in your life, and I'm drawing you along. He says, there, this is the manifestation of the love of God towards you. God looks down at us, sends his only son. Those of us who are far from God, enemies of God, sends his only son. He pays dearly, but to pays for our souls to wash us clean so that we can live eternally with him. He says, that message, the gospel, it is the demonstration, he says, of what I mean when I say this manner of love the Father has shown us. And he basically says, only those who've experienced that love, who know God, know what Jesus has done for them, can express that kind of love. He says, and if they don't, express that kind of love, then clearly they, they don't know. They've not had that encounter with Jesus. Now, i got to be honest, I, I, as I was studying this, I wrestled with that. And I'm like, okay, this is God's word. I, I'm, I'm going to choose to believe it, but I'm wrestling. And so I, I uh, went and talked to Pastor Justin about it, and I was like, hey, let me just chew on this with you a little bit. And, and um, I, I said, okay, here's where I, I hear what this is saying, and I, I will, will believe it, but I'm just, here's what, you know, it just seems like there are great demonstrations of love out there by people who would probably say they're not Christ followers, right? I said, you know, like, wouldn't there be a, a there's got to be out there a firefighter who would say, no, I'm, I'm not a follower of Christ, but who's run into a burning building, sacrificing or risking his life or her life, who've run in there to save some innocent person and put their lives on the line. I mean, that's a great act of love, right? I mean, what, what's John talking about here? And um, we were talking about with Justin, and he said, well, yeah, that's actually for sure. That is a great act of heroism. In fact, here in our church, we have tons of firefighters and law enforcement and military personnel, people who put their lives on the line, risk them every day for us. And that is something that we celebrate, absolutely incredible demonstrations of love. But what Justin said is he said, yeah, that's, that's absolutely true, but that's not really the right illustration for the gospel. He says, because what God did for us is not as much like a firefighter running into a burning house and saving an innocent person. It's more like a firefighter running into a house to save the arsonist. The gospel is, is more like running in for a not innocent person. In fact, running in for the person who lit the fire. In fact, that actually doesn't really go far enough because actually it's not just that we were just out in general enemies. We were directly enemies towards God. And so actually, if we were to change the illustration to make it picture the gospel a little bit more, it would be like an arsonist targeting a firefighter's house, lighting it on fire to try and do as much damage to the firefighter and his family, and that firefighter choosing to run in to save that arsonist who tried to do him harm. That's a little bit more like the gospel. But actually still doesn't go far enough because Jesus didn't come to the earth risking his life. He came to earth knowing he was going to die. So imagine the scenario where this firefighter sees his house in flames that this arsonist had intentionally lit on fire and he knows when he runs in, the situation is such that if he's going to save this person, he's going to have to lift, this, lift him out the window knowing that he will for sure die. It's more like a firefighter running into certain death to save an enemy that tried to do him harm. But that still doesn't actually get the full 
picture of the gospel because what did this passage say? It cued us to think about it like this. It says, God sent his son, his only son. So now imagine this scenario. It's an arsonist targeting the house of a fire chief. And for some reason, this guy wants to tear, do as much damage he can to this man and his family and lights the man's house on fire and then the arsonist gets stuck inside. And the fire chief is back at the station. He hears that his house is on fire and there's only one person there, another firefighter, is there on the scene and it's his son. And he hears over the radio, Dad, your house is on fire and the arsonist is inside. I I need to go in and try and save him. Imagine the father saying, yes, but if if you go in there, you will definitely die. And he says, I know, but I need to go to try and save him. And can you imagine that man sending his son to save someone who is an enemy of his, knowing that he'll die? That's the manner of love the Father has shown to us. Do you know who we are in that equation? The arsonist. We were enemies of God. And he showed such unbelievable love that he sent his son to die in our place so that we might have life. Man, that level of love, man, that's extraordinary. That's not something you see in this life. And here's what he said in light of that. Here's how he says, what he says next in 1 John 4, verse 11. He said, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Can I just break this down a little bit, what's happening behind the scenes in the, the original ancient Greek here? This is what it's, it's saying here. He's saying, Beloved, if this is the manner in which God loves you, if this is the type of love, if God is showing you this level of love, when he says we ought to love one another, it's really the force there is, we, because of that, don't we owe love to one another? How could we be loved so extraordinarily and then just walk away? How could that, that transform our lives and our eternity and for us then not have that expressed in our lives? He says, if he has loved us in that manner, we owe love to each other. In fact, that's not the first time he said this. First John 3, 16, a chapter before, he says, by this we know love. You want to know what love is? He says, here it is, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. What he's talking here about love is something, it's, it's so much more than, all right, let's all just, West Pines, let's just try and be nicer. Let's just try and be a little more polite. Let's just try and be nicer to our friends and, and while we're commuting and in our emails to our coworkers. So much more than that. He's saying the type of love Christian that's been shown to you is this extraordinary, otherworldly, self-sacrificing love. It's a commitment to do acts of utter selflessness for another. And he says, man, if you've experienced that level of love from God, if you, if you know God and have been born of God, then, then, then you'll, this will be something that's instinctual. And if you don't show this kind of selfless love, then maybe you've got to ask if you've ever encountered that love of God to that degree. It's almost like this. Uh, there's a, a family that I, I grew up around, a buddy of mine, I've, I've known him all my life. And if you saw the, in his parents' house the pictures of him and his siblings when they were growing up, they all have a look. You guys know what I'm talking about? There's a family maybe that you know, and they all have that family resemblance. There's just a look. And as he uh, grew up, got married, and he has had kids, all of his kids have the look, okay? They all have that same family resemblance, okay? In fact, like if he showed me another child and it didn't have the look, I'd be a little concerned. Like that's a little fishy, okay? All the people in this family have the look, okay? This is what... John's saying, 
If you've been born of God, you have the look. If you've been born of God, there's a family resemblance. There's a trait. You can't help it, but you have it. You've been so born of God, born of this incredible, sacrificial, selfless love that you can't help but express that sacrificial, selfless love. In fact, we'll share it with each other, first and foremost, with our brothers and sisters. Here's the push for these next few weeks. We're called to love in this extraordinary way that's just is supposed to be a family attribute if we've been born of God and we've, our lives have had this collision with the message of the gospel and been transformed. And so the challenge is figuring out how to have that and, and where to express that. And so here's what the push is going to be for the next few weeks. We have venues here at our church called groups. And these groups are set up so that we can enter into these groups and express this kind of love in this, in this community. We have all different types of groups, no matter what stage of life that you're in, if you're empty nesters, if you're just out of school, everything in between. We have groups that have, some have childcare, some don't. Um, you can g- get into a group if you're married, if you're not married. You, we have groups that are English speaking, Spanish speaking, on campus, off campus. We have some groups that get together, they talk about the text that we study on Sunday and kind of dig into it so that we're not just hearers of what was taught going in one ear and out the other, but we're actually doers of what we're hearing and learning. We have some groups that talk about marriage, some groups that talk about parenting. We have this venue called Groups, and you're going to be challenged for the next few weeks to get into a group so that we can do what this passage is calling us to do, to love in an extraordinary way as a picture of the gospel. So we're going to do things a little bit different today as we're wrapping up our time together. We're going to actually have a mini group up here to discuss groups. So I'm going to invite our mini group out here. Would you help me welcome our mini group that's going to come out and join us here? Okay, and uh, we're going to just discuss this dynamic. Let me just introduce to you who is here in our mini group. We have uh, your pastor, Josh Bramos, your worship pastor, Josh Bramos, right here. I was, ex- I was expecting cheers. It was a slow pity clap is what I heard. Josh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, we have your ministries pastor, Dan Gossett, right here. Why, why can't you be more like Dan? I don't, I don't know. Um, we've got the lovely, beautiful, and intelligent Rebecca Barnes sitting with me here. Obviously the favorite. And so... We're talking about groups, and and groups is a venue. It's a place for us to express this love and work out this idea of um, love that, that when we encounter the gospel, we're experiencing that kind of love. So let's dialogue about this a little bit. Um, how does groups create that venue to express this kind of, this kind of love? Yes. Yeah, so uh, first, thank you for inviting me to your living room. Thank it's you. massive. <laughs> but the one thing is there's no uh, snacks, so. Sorry about the food. Next time. Oh, no, All no. groups have food. If, if they don't, they're not really a group. Okay, continue. <laughs> Agreed. Um, I think the best way we can um, represent Christ well is, it, and, is to show love to one another. It's burying one another's burdens in small group and community group. And one way we can do that is through transparency. Um, I think when we go to places, often we want to get something out of it, which is in a wrong standpoint. And then also if we just want to give, it's the wrong standpoint, but it's bearing one of those burdens. And by doing that, I have to be transparent. So it's, it's me coming to the, gr- or the group and saying, you know, Dan, I know you have uh, four, chil- four children, four children. <laughs> I as well have four children. And I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> How do I survive? How do I uh, love my wife well and then respect my kids and raise them in a godly manner and have devotions at the table? And uh, how, how do I do this? I feel like I'm drowning sometimes. And it's me coming and being open with my life. Whether it's, hey, Roby and Rebecca, uh, my marriage is struggling. Or, hey, we, we're having financial problems. How do we manage the money that God has given us well? And it's being transparent. That's, that's probably the most important thing. And, and one of the greatest things that I like to look at is this. God speaks to us in many different ways. He speaks to us through worship, through the message, through the word of God, through dreams or visions. But one of the ways he speaks to us, and I think it's the most common way, is through other brothers and sisters in Christ who have the spirit that dwells in them. God speaks through them to teach us. So when I open myself up to them in a group, hey, how do I, what do I do? I need to, I need help, or how can I give back? Or it's God speaking through them, or it's God speaking through me in community. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I also think it's an excellent venue 
for us to kind of work out a lot of things. Like, I don't know about your all's family, but I've, my family's really busy, right? So you can get caught up quickly in, you know, car lines or commutes or, you know, if the kids have sports or maybe you've got another hobby or a long Netflix queue. Like, there's a lot going on. The priorities. Yeah, yeah your exactly. priorities, you know, if they're in order. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot going on, and you can go years without experiencing a place mm. where you can be honest about life, and you can talk through things and share struggles and burdens and learn from each other and even be a voice that God uses to somebody else to be able to talk about your own story, what God's teaching you, and, and encourage somebody else. So you can go years without experiencing that if, you, if you're too busy. And group is such a great place because it's for a season. There's one night a week. You sit down and you talk about these things. And it's not like every night you've got these deep, heartfelt needs that you start talking about. But just over the course of normal conversation, whatever the topic the group is, those kinds of things come up and you talk through them. And that's so healthy and helpful to be able to go through that. And if you don't, you completely miss out on it. You miss out on what God wants to do in your life, what he's wanting to do in the lives of the people around you. Uh, you just completely miss out on that because you're too busy at that point. Yeah, that's good. It's interesting how often one of our, our biggest excuses for not being in a group is being busy. But it's exactly because we're busy that groups is a great venue because otherwise we can go months, years, or longer without applying this basic family trait of loving each other and with acceptance and, and having the freedom to be vulnerable and sharing and, and building each other. That's great. Um, let, let's get a lady's perspective, also a counselor's perspective. Some of you know uh, my wife, Rebecca, is a counselor because God knew that I needed a full-time therapist in my life. And so um, let's, let me ask you this. So, Rebecca, what would be the best way to uh, approach a group? Like, what's the mindset to, uh, as we're entering into a, a group? Yeah, I think, you know, as a female especially, you know, we have a deep desire to really connect and to have that in the form of relationships. And um, when approaching a group, I really feel like the gospel kind of flips this concept upside down, where we go first to serve and to meet needs, and in some seasons, to be the one that's receiving the service. Um, and then out of that flows just that genuine journeying life together kind of relationships that I think we all desire and that we're all really designed for. Um, one of my favorite verses is in Proverbs, and it says, um, as you refresh others, you yourself will become refreshed. And I find that to be true in um, that community setting, whereas if you go with the mindset first to you know, meet people where they're at and serve them, um, then really what a byproduct that happens that comes from that is just that genuine, authentic relationship. Yeah, that's so good. Um, we can often think about, okay, I'm going to set aside a, a night a week, and that's great because I have these needs to get met. And, but, but the cr true Christian community flips that around. I don't go to get my needs met. I go to serve. It's Jesus washing feet, and it's in that context of going to serve that that we're, we're blessed. That, that is, that's really awesome. So, okay, so Dan, walk us through, if someone's here or watching online and they just practically, how would they go from here to getting into a group? Like, what would they, what does that practically look like? Yeah, so if you're here or online, you need your phone first. So go ahead and grab your phone. I know everybody's got their phone. You don't need to act like you don't have a phone. You had it before you put pants on today. Go ahead and get your phone. Uh, here's what you want to do. Go to this website. You're going to go to westpines.org. It's really uncomfortable, Dan, that you said that. How did you know that I had my phone before my pants? I just, uh, I don't just know. keep going. Let's, let's just, just yeah, Let's keep going. All right, so go to westpines.org slash groups. Westpines.org slash groups. And there, if you scroll down a little bit on the page, there's a button that says find the groups. So the page looks like that. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a button that says find a group. And then when you click that button, it's going to bring you to a list of groups that looks like this. So this list is all of the groups that are starting this fall. Uh, all the details are there in the different groups. You can get in there. You can find different groups, different days or times that work better for you. Uh, some are meeting here at the church. Others are meeting out in the community. But you can find a list of groups. And then see there's that, that gray button, email leaders. That's an important one. When you go ahead and click on that, it's going to bring up a form that looks like this where you just put in your name, your email address, and you're sending off a quick email to them. And here's what you should put in the email body. I'm interested. Just that simple. I'm interested. All the group leaders are ready for it. They're waiting for that email. They know what that means. Uh, all you're saying is, hey, I'm interested in this group. 
And this week, that group leader is going to get back with you. They're going to give you more information about the group. They're going to maybe give you other details, establish a contact. So by the first time you go, you'll know somebody. Uh, but this is a great way to go ahead and find a group. And here's what that means. When you're saying, I'm interested, what you're saying is, hey, I'd like to try out this group for a little while. You're not committing to go to the group from now until the next presidential election. You're committing to go for this season. Or you're even saying, you're not even committing to go for the season. You say, hey, I'm interested. I want to check it out. Tell me more about it so that I can find out if this is the right group for me to jump into. And maybe if you, if you want a little bit more clarity or maybe you don't want to use your phone today, another thing you can do right after the service is out in the lobby. We've got some volunteers out there that would love to answer any questions you have, maybe direct you toward a particular group, uh, and also can help you get signed up in a group today as well. So either your phone, westpines.org slash groups, or stop by, see some of the volunteers at the tables in the lobby, and they'd love to connect you with a group. Okay, awesome. So if someone's looking for more questions. I need to know more details. There's people ready in that front lobby. Um, okay, any, any closing thoughts, Rebecca, just for us thinking about groups? I think just, you know, consider finding out more information today. Um, I think sometimes some of our past or previous experiences or even some fears can um, interrupt us from wanting to try something new. And so I would just encourage you to just check it out. Take that step and, and uh, jump in. So, all right, we're going to close with a, a song here in just a second. But, Josh, talk us through why this song after a, a, a Sunday like this with a theme like this. What, what, what makes this song the right one for us to close on? Yeah, and we're going to sing a hymn for the last song called Blessed Assurance. And in verse 1 it says, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And we have this foretaste of what it's going to be like in heaven because Christ dwells with us currently. And then we're going to experience that with him for eternity. It's a foretaste of heaven. And in the chorus, it says this. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And we have a testimony. We have a story to share. And this is kind of correlates with the community groups is that when we're in those community groups, we can share our testimony. We can share God's grace. We can share our story. And then it's edifying the church. It's glorifying him. And it's creating in us a song that, that is 24-7, praising our Savior by sharing the grace and the love that God has given to us, to those around. So it's a good closing song for this service. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to sing that in just a second here. But uh, first, help me thank our mini group here for uh, their input. Thank you, guys. And um, here's, church, here's the challenge. I want to put this challenge out to you. If you are not in a group currently, then sign up. And I'm not even just going to say sign up this week. I'm going to challenge you to sign up today, to jump in before you go to bed tonight, um, either on your phone, on the computer, go talk to someone in the back, but sign up today so that you can have a venue where you're practicing this family trait of loving um, like we have been we have been loved. And so um, the second thing is you, you might be here and, um, and you might be here like, look, I just need to take that step and find forgiveness from God, the forgiveness you talked about, just what Jesus has done um, for me because of the cross. And if you want to put your faith in Jesus, then in just a moment, we're going to be singing. And as um, we start to sing, just in the quietness of that moment, other people singing around you, just pray to something simple to God. Just say, God, Jesus, I, I surrender to you. Thank you for what you've done to, to save me. Thank you for what you've done to transform me. And so maybe you're watching online. Maybe this is your moment where you, you put your faith in Jesus for the first time. And if you do that, uh, if you're here, I'd ask that you just, in, on your bulletin, after you just kind of have that quiet moment of prayer while we're singing, just tear off that part of your, bu your bulletin uh, on the side and just check the box that says you put your faith in Jesus for the first time. We just want to share that moment with you. And just put that in one of the offering boxes as you leave. There's a place to click online if you put your faith in Jesus. And so here, here's what we're going to do. You know, as we're thinking about loving and, and pushing ourselves to, to love with this sacrificial selflessness, you might say, look, I don't know if I can do that. I, I don't know if I can take that step. I don't know if I can jump in a group or jump back in a group. Or you, you say, look, I, I, I want to take this step. I just don't know if I can overcome some of the selfishness in my life. Here's the first step. It, it's for us remembering how we have been loved and to think and to celebrate what an incredible Savior that we have. That even though we we're enemies with God, He came in and gave His life for us. So we're going to end this time just reflecting on Jesus. Would you stand with me as we close with this song?